Oh, welcome to the Atlas Bio ABC123 Biodiesel Package. Uh, if you're listening and watching right now, you have entered in the first disc in our four disc series, and that is uh, Getting Started uh, Biodiesel Technology um, and Three Secrets. Um, right now, we're going to start with the folders that you should have received along with this video. Um, we'll start with the first one, that being let's see, your standard operating procedures manual. Within that, you're going to have this video, the ABC123 Getting Started Biodiesel Tech Education and Three Secrets video, which is you're watching right now. The other three videos focus specifically on uh, the standard operating procedures for biodiesel production using the Appleseed processor, which we recommend using um, from our third party vendor. Uh, contained in this package, um, in addition, to uh, the SOPs is a valve labeling guide. When uh, you receive this package in your MSDS folder, we'll get to that in one second, um, you'll find out where to download the diagrams that you're going to use um, and where to get uh, supplies to either buy at your local hardware store or go through our third party vendor which can send you a package um, which then you put together at home and you use these valve labels to identify each every individual valve in your system. That, that puts us on the same page um, when you use our system and we're all talking about the same valves. When you call us up if you need help, we know exactly what you're talking about. That's what's great about standardization. There's no longer 10, 15, 20 different designs out there and nobody really can identify which valve to use. Um, we make it easy by labeling them and using the exact same equipment uh, setup that we use. Um, then we all know exactly where the other person is and we can help you out directly uh, with any of your biodiesel needs. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have four pieces of equipment. We have the processor reactor, that's one, um, an auxiliary tank, um, a wash tank, and then a biodiesel dryer. All four of these uh, are used within our system and that's how we've uh, successfully been able to achieve ASTM D67 spec um, each time. So we've done that for you. Um, if you want to go get spec yourself um, and get the full testing, it's going to range anywhere from about uh, around eleven $1 hundred dollars. So that's why it makes this uh, system that we've put together is the exact same system we use to keep producing to that standard. It'll save you uh, the extra cost of $1,100 in uh, having to go out and get the test yourself. If you follow our manual um, to the T, um, you'll probably receive the same quality results that we have. So this first section is valve labels. This is for after you've produced uh, your equipment. Um, and then we go through chapter by chapter, uh, which parallels the videos. Um, this is the written documentation that it is exactly coincides with that chapter by chapter. Chapter one, manually filtering your vegetable oil if you get it from a, a waste or a vegetable oil source like a restaurant or stuff like that. Um, heating and, and automated filtering of your oil, uh, putting that oil into your processor after it's been filtered, uh, how to do a, a proper titration, um, preparation of your methoxide solution, aka your uh, methyl alcohol mixed with uh, sodium hydroxide we recommend. Um, introduction of that into the processor reactor, um, wait 24 hours after reaction takes place, and then uh, the draining of glycerol and the transfer and separation of your glycerol product and your methyl ester product, also known as biodiesel product, into the wash tank. Um, and then uh, how to train after you do uh, successful wash procedures, uh, you transfer that into your bio dry, which then will get out excess moisture and or methanol. And uh, the final product would be pumped into a, uh, a pump station and uh, we'll show you how to test your biodiesel as well using really cost-effective ways of doing so. Uh, we recommend that if you'd like, you can spend the $1,100 and have full ISTM testing. That'll get you a nice paper. Uh, but if you follow these tests, you'll know whether or not your biodiesel is in spec within 98% confidence level. So anyways, this is our standard operating procedures. And as you can see, we have checklists here um, and detailed you know, what to do. Um, these are pretty detailed. and they correspond exactly to the video. So we recommend you watch all the videos once through at least, construct your equipment, um, and then when you understand how the equipment works, um, you just use it as a check sheet, and uh, before you know it, you'll be producing ASTM biodiesel in no time. And uh, you'll be able to put it in all your vehicles that have diesel engines, and uh, you'll be really happy with yourself. So this is the standard operating procedures manual. Um, next is our MSDS manual. Now this is really important. This, uh, this, this manual here shows you one, where to uh, register your product. Uh, here we have a, a registration code. Now this is unique to you. So when you type in your password, um, when you create a password and you use an email, you can only once, once this is registered, this is assigned once to one person, and that email is gonna be your login name. 
So uh, be really careful in what you assign. Otherwise, if you lose this, you're gonna have a hard time. Um, you're gonna have to give us a call. We're gonna spend a lot of wasted time trying to get you back in the system. So this is really important. It's sort of like software licensing. Uh, this is yours specifically. When you register this, you won't be able to transfer it to any other person, stuff like that. So this keeps all the uh, proprietary information uh, kept, you know, to you, for you, and uh, doesn't allow anybody else to leech off of it. So uh, let's go through this manually. Register your product when you're ready to. Uh, I'd say do it so immediately. That'll give you access to download diagrams and uh, how to build uh, kits and stuff like that that we offer that's included in this manual. Um, in keeping a proper material safety data sheet book, um, this is really for OSHA, fire department standards, stuff like that, compliance issues. Uh, keep a chemical inventory, and we have a sample sheet in here. You want to create something similar to this on Excel or some other similar spreadsheet. You can even do it by pencil. But what you do is you keep the amount of chemicals you have on hand, and the amount of chemicals should correspond to this first chapter, the MSDSs themselves. So when you buy your chemicals, whatever chemical supplier you go through, ask them for, when they give you sodium hydroxide, ask them for an MSDS. Punch it, bind it, put it in here, number it, it'll correspond to how much you have. So if you buy 50 pounds from, let's say, uh, I don't know, any chemical company, Varian or something like that, uh, write it down, record it, get the MSDS from them, put it in here. Therefore, you know if something goes wrong, get on your hands, how to wash, how to you know keep, keep your uh, area safe. Whether it be a shop, garage, uh, big plant, doesn't matter. This is necessary. Do it. Um, next step is, uh, let's see, number two, and that is where you keep your maps. Um, you want to create a map of your facility, where all the chemicals are that are dangerous. Keep them in a fireproof cabinet if possible. Um, also, where your methanol is being stored. Therefore, if something goes wrong in your garage and the fire department needs to come, they can come and and you know, concentrate on the areas that need to be concentrated on. These maps are good to register whether you're a small business, home operator, or a large business. These are really good to give the fire department. You're also going to need to uh, get a placard, which are those uh, HMIS numbers uh, that correspond to uh, the, the health, fire, and uh, reactive uh, standards. Those are also for the fire department and other people just so people are safe. So these are all safety precautions that we recommend you get in the habit of doing early. Um, then you don't have to worry about it when you get fairly large. Um, all right, becoming legal documentation. Uh, these and the following chapters in this MSDS, there's a lot of uh, written material, and that's going to be active and, and uh, I should say dynamic, meaning it's going to be evolving over time. So use your login name that we established here to access the members area of, of, your, uh, of, of your website and download all the sections 4 through 9 here, and that'll give you everything you need to know. And within those sections, we've got Becoming legal, uh, we'll tell you how to contact the IRS and what forms you need to fill out, uh, what municipalities you need to talk to, what we've done. Um, of course, it's going to be different for whatever location you're in, but we'll give you as much information as we've uh, we've collected for ourselves to get to where we're going. Um, SVO filtering station, download the information. These are all pretty much uh, the how-to build guides and diagrams on what and where you should, uh, you know. Not where, but uh, how you build your wash tank, your process reactor, your bio dryer, stuff like that. Store all that stuff here. And in addition, other equipment. When you buy stuff from, let's say, a Harbor Freight pump, they give you an MSDS, put it in here. Basically, collect all of your information that's related to biodiesel. Keep it in here for reference. It's a real nice binder to have. And keep this next to your station. So in case you have a worker, a friend, you know, whoever's working with you on your biodiesel stuff, they can read the safety data sheets. They can understand, you know, the hazards involved therein. So. Right now, that pretty much concludes getting started. Um, I would recommend that before you put together anything, that you go through and watch the other three videos. The Biodiesel Processing Chapters 1 through 4, Biodiesel Processing 5 through 8, which 8 is cut in half and is extended to the 4th DVD and ends in 10. In watching these, there's over three hours of video on these remaining CDs, DVDs, I should say, high definition. You should watch these. If you have any questions, at that point, you should be pretty confident that you can create uh, biodiesel and, and create good biodiesel at that. So if you have any questions, give us a call. Um, I'd love to talk about biodiesel. I'm uh, pretty, pretty knowledgeable at it at this stage in the game. So uh, we're, we're confident that we can answer any questions you may have. So give us a call if you have any, and uh, we'd love to continue on. Uh, the next part of uh, this DVD, the Getting Started DVD, is uh, biodiesel technology. And I'm going to go and give you kind of a basic overview of what biodiesel is, what biodiesel isn't, and uh, what processing is involved in the successful creation of ASTM biodiesel. 
So thanks for your time in uh, purchasing this uh, DVD and uh, informational package. We uh, think it uh, is going to help you as much as it helps us because we run a lot of vehicles on it and we've had a lot of uh, good experience uh, helping other people get started as well. So with that in mind, thanks for your time and we will talk to you in about 10 seconds and we'll start our biodiesel technology course. Take care. All right, welcome back. Uh, this is the second part of the first DVD. This is the biodiesel technology course. And uh, with this, we're going to give you a quick overview, a concise and accurate overview of what biodiesel is, what biodiesel isn't, uh, what biodiesel uh, technology uh, requires and, and, uh, and what's involved in it. So we'll start from the basics. Uh, what is biodiesel? Well, biodiesel is uh, the result of a chemical reaction of a catalyst and alcohol with uh, triglycerides. Uh, triglycerides are also known as uh, vegetable oils. So what we do is we take a, a vegetable oil, which is basically a hydrocarbon of sorts, um, and we react it with uh, uh, a catalyst, sodium hydroxide. And in the presence of that sodium hydroxide, it reacts with our methyl alcohol. Um, the result is two different products. Um, we've got a glycerin product, which is, I believe, I'm checking for my notes, yeah, is a, is a hydrocarbon group. Um, and uh, it's got three hydrocarbons attached to it. So we have a glycerol byproduct, which usually uh, results in about 10%, 10 to 20% of our reaction, we've noticed. Um, and then our main product, which is our methyl esters. And methyl esters is biodiesel. Uh, so short, transesterification is the reaction that occurs from triglycerides in the presence of a sodium hydroxide and methanol solution. The result is two products, glycerol, also known as glycerin, and methyl esters, also known as biodiesel. So the short is we take vegetable oils, put them in a super saturated or a saturated solution of alcohol in the presence of a catalyst, sodium hydroxide and or potassium hydroxide, a resultant reaction occurs giving us biodiesel and glycerol. That's the overview. Um, the specifics are as such. Um, that's called transesterification. And that's basically the process of making biodiesel. And the making of biodiesel is deceptively simple. Um, I'm sure if you've gotten this far in the game, you've realized that you can make biodiesel in a one or a two liter, uh, you know, jug. I'm sure you've seen those demonstrations online and or in person. Um, you can also make biodiesel in big bats. Uh, I've, I know a number of uh, biodiesel producers that don't make ASTM biodiesel, but do it out in the open with big bats, big stainless steel bats and stuff like that in the presence of an oversaturated solution of methanol and callus. And it's a real, you know, they have a low quality control, but they are in fact making biodiesel in a very uncontrolled way. We do things a little differently. We have a very controlled way of making biodiesel and we conform to a lot of scientific standards that have been discovered over the past 30, 40 years of this process. So up until now it's been you know, more of a large scale uh, you know, system where people in Europe have been using for quite some time. But uh, due to a lot of advancements in American ingenuity and uh, inventive uh, spirit here, uh, people have started using uh, small, uh, you know, basically hardware available, everywhere available uh, supplies to make their own fuel, which is awesome. And that's what we're trying to help you with, is uh, get to the point where we can provide you with the information to make high quality, government grade fuel that you can put in any vehicle. Now, if you're like us, you're going to be satisfied in fueling a number of vehicles, but then you're going to get really interested in uh, growing larger and, per, per, you know, per chance moving beyond just personal use and then getting into selling and distributing to a number of other people and or businesses. Um, one thing that we provide that nobody else provides is uh, tax knowledge. And uh, we've had to go through the necessary steps and it's taken us months to do so, literally six months to even sit down with an IRS agent to get our licensing from the federal government. What we'll do is we'll document all this for you, our customer, and put this on our website. And that'll be a dynamic, uh, you know, dynamic system in which we'll be updating and constantly giving you new information in the future. So um, this is basically a good starting point for you. You want to start by making really good fuel. You don't want to go big and make really crap fuel and screw up your cars. That's a bad thing to think of. So don't do it the wrong way. Do it the right way. You're doing it the right way by listening to this. And you have access to our uh, back-end uh, information on our website um, once you register your product. So. Let's go and uh, let's, let's talk a little bit further about what biodiesel is. And since we now know kind of what transesterification is, we'll tell you our inside secrets on how to make biodiesel. Um, a lot of it is, is known, some of it uh, is up for debate on websites, but we can only attest to the fact what has worked for us into, in, in actually successfully making ASTM biodiesel. And that's our formula. Um, Number one, and this is probably one of the secrets, is, is getting a good oil supply. Now we're going to assume that you follow those directions and you have a good oil supply and this formula works for good 
like dewatered oil. Oil basically has no uh, excess water in it. And in order to make sure you have no water, you have to test it. But uh, if you have a good way of obtaining oil, uh, you usually have pretty high confidence that it doesn't have any excess water in it. So with good oil, the formula is pretty simple. If you have 100 gallons of oil, you want to use 22% methanol with that solution. Now, 100 gallons, 22%, that equals about 22 gallons of methanol per 100 gallons of vegetable oil. So we use a 22% methanol solution. How much sodium hydroxide? Well, we, first off, you can use potassium hydroxide. We prefer sodium hydroxide. It's cheaper, and we just have better results with it. Uh, so, I, you know, this whole manual our system is based on sodium hydroxide. So get on the same page with this, use sodium hydroxide. Now, sodium hydroxide varies. Because we use WBO in these small test batches that uh, we've used and obtained uh, ASTM with WBO, um, that's the hardest stuff to use because it has a variable free fatty acid content. Now, you find out your free fatty acids by doing a titration, which is described in detail in Chapter 4 in the video and in the SOP manual. So, you do a titration, find out your free fatty acids. We use a baseline 5 grams per liter in, a, in a chemical, in, in, in testing our chemicals, we use 5 grams per liter plus our titration value. So, if you have a titration value of 2, that means you use 2 more grams per liter. So, if you have 5 grams per liter plus 2, you have 7 grams per liter. Now, a liter is roughly... Uh, 3.875 uh, gallons. So you can do that conversion. That's how many grams you're going to use. So basically, and I should reverse, if you have 100 liters of, of vegetable oil, you're going to use 22 uh, liters of methanol. So the conversion's there. It's just 22% whatever units you use. So 22% methanol and sodium hydroxide, 5 plus your titration value uh, per, per uh, liter. And then you have the basic formula. Um, an extension of the basic formula is your reaction time. Um, we recommend and we use and we've obtained results, positive results, by heating our oil in between 135 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, with that temperature range right there, you can vary within a couple degrees, but keep it within 135 and 140, react your oil for three hours, period. Um, we've heard you can get away with one and a half, some people do longer than four, but we've had results, and again, we have ASTM results at three hours reaction time. So, heat your oil up. Introduce the chemicals, react for three hours, shut off. Let it sit for 24, separate as we describe in the subsequent chapters in our DVDs and in uh, our SOP manual. So that's kind of the overview of how to make biodiesel and what formulas we use, and we recommend you do the same, because you will also have a higher level of, uh, uh, a higher chance of, of meeting ASTM spec. Um, so what's going on? Why, what, what, actually let's talk about what is actually happening. So we know that we have these triglycerides, which then get broken down to diglycerides, which then get broken down to monoglycerides. That's the process. You're breaking tries are easier to break with your catalyst and with your uh, methanol solution. Um, the last things to break down are your monoglycerides. Um, you want to shoot for a 98% completed reaction, meaning the three hours, within three hours, you should have a greater than 98% reaction. And the reaction kind of occurs if you have basically a curve like this. You're going to start off reacting a lot, and your percentages are going to be approaching basically 100%. If 100% reaction is your goal, the longer time you go, the more this curve kind of approaches a Zeno's paradox type of situation, in which you're approaching 100%, but your amount of time to get one more percent and 0.5%, 0.02%, as you approach that line of 100%, you're going to take longer and longer to get there. And in fact, you will never get 100% conversion. Um, your goal is 100%, but we found that that 98%, greater than 98%, you will meet spec, you're maximizing your amount of uh, energy usage, and uh, you're going to make great product. So, this reaction curve occurs, three hours, shut off your vessel, and you've got uh, a greater than 90, 98% reaction if you've tested your oil correctly and you've used the prescribed amount of chemicals. Should be stated, don't skimp on your chemicals. Uh, I know of companies that said, okay, 22, well, why don't we just go to 21? Why don't we go to 20? and you're talking about percentages of methanol here, oh, 19 might work, and it'll work, and then all of a sudden, boom, they've gone to 18, they've gone to seven, you know, 18 and a half, 18, and just before you know it, their whole batch is shot, and they scratch their heads, what went wrong, and before you know it, they've already put it in their vehicles, and they've got problems. Their, their fuel injectors are clogged, stuff like that, all because they wanted to save about 50, no, about two cents a gallon, five cents a gallon. Really, it's not worth it. You want to build a high quality product, um, you don't want to risk the health of your engine and or warranties and stuff like that. So don't skimp on your chemicals. Uh, we never, you know, we just never even thought of it because just don't do it. It's a bad idea. Uh, just to save a little buck, you can really cause some damage to your vehicles. Um, 
So I say that uh, what's going on is, is we want a complete reaction. The number one uh, ASTM uh, test is, is the total glycerin. And, and basically what that is is, is how much, how much uh, haven't you reacted. If uh, you fail this test, your body still is all bad. You're going to have to re-react it at the correct, at the correct uh, how should I say, percent. So really, the most important is getting a complete reaction. Um, subsequent uh, important specifications for biodiesel, uh, free glycerin um, means you didn't wash, you know, if, if you didn't separate your uh, glycerin from your biodiesel correctly, you're going to have some of that in there. And or, you know, even if you have a bad separation, usually your wash should, your wash waters, your water washes should get out the excess uh, glycerin from your system. So uh, a poor wash, you'll have free glycerin. Um, another one, Flashpoint. Um, if you don't use a bio dryer, um, if you don't use the bio dryer as we use it, or you have residual methanol inside your biodiesel, your flash point is going to be too high. It's going to have a twofold effect. For one, you may think that methanol is good for your engine. It's not. Um, it's, it, it doesn't give you any type of uh, BTU energy boost or anything like that. In fact, it's not good for your engine at all. Um, two, uh, biodiesel usually has a, a flammability rating of one because its flash point is so high. If you have residual methanol, that's going to drop it below. And I know that there is some uh, some government uh, test or government movements out there raising or lowering the flash point of biodiesel um, for ASTM. But uh, currently, um, if you have methanol in there, you actually may have a flammable liquid on your hands. Whereas biodiesel, uh, as as the government describes, is non-flammable when it has no methanol in it. So use the bio dryer. That's why it's uh, been created is to make sure you well for one it's been created. It's also a filtering system. But uh, for number two, it's to get the methanol out. Um, so you don't want you don't want methanol in there. Um, Sulfated ash. If you don't do a correct wash, you're going to have uh, basically soaps in your biodiesel. Not good. That stuff will clog fuel injectors because soaps are actually kind of these gummy long chains of uh, you know it's soap, and uh, they actually form kind of threads. And you you don't want that in your biodiesel. In fact, you'll notice that in, in certain type of wash situations, you'll have that film, the soapy film, build on the top of your biodiesel. It happens, especially uh, when you use a uh, a pre or acid pretreatment like we do, you're going to have residual uh, soaps. You know, then you're going to have that filmy layer. You don't want that coming through your gas tank or your fuel filters. Um, acid value. Um, you know, if you store your biodiesel in bad containers in the presence of water or you know just the elements uh, for nine months, sometimes it can happen. Sixty days, six months is pretty. You know, if you could store your biodiesel for six months, that's pretty typical. But after that, you run the risk of it going rancid, meaning bad. You want to use your biodiesel as soon as you produce it, pretty much. You want to basically either distribute it, sell it, if you have the correct licensing, of course, and or just burn it um, in your vehicles as soon as you make it. The longer it sits, the more likely it's going to break down, which is the case with petrol diesel number two. A lot of people don't know that, but petrol diesel, it goes bad too. Um, it may be a shock to some people, but go to a farmer and he'll tell you he has an old tractor that hasn't run in a while, he better drain that gas tank because that stuff is definitely no longer good. So those are the major uh, points. There's there's 14 tests in ASTM. The other ones pretty much fall um, behind these these primary five. Um, I'll basically water sediment. You don't want water in there. Bio dryer will help you with that. Uh, you typically want to put your bio dryer on during low humidity days because biodiesel has a propensity to absorb moisture, especially higher temperatures. So run your bio dryer during low humidity days if possible in your region. Um, cloud point. That's for people living, uh, you know, where it can get cold during the winter. Um, cloud point's going to vary. Uh, unfortunately, biodiesel has one little problem with it. It, it, it actually freezes, it, it solidifies faster than diesel number two. That's usually solved with mixtures um, of biodiesel with petrol diesel. And I know that in Yellowstone and a couple f federal parks where it gets cold, that uh, they use blends, which they haven't had any uh, basically gel problems. But cloud point is like a predecessor to gelling. Um, so biodiesel has a lower, is a, you know, clouds uh, at a little warmer temperature than diesel number two. So that's an issue, but depends on your region. Um, carbon residue, uh, high, you know, that's another function of glycerin. So if, if you have high glycerin, it could clog your, uh, clog your uh, carbon deposits, carbon deposits in your engine. Um, phosphorus, uh, it depends on what oil you're using. Some oils don't have residual gums, some do. Uh, if you're getting oil from a supplier, uh, usually it's been degummed, uh, so that's really not a, not a big issue. Um, the other ones, viscosity, sulfur, uh, sulfur, usually waste vegetable oil is the only one you'll have problems with sulfur. Um, sometimes if you use really, really, really cooked used vegetable oil, it could have high sulfur content. Mix it with good, good oil that you have. Kind of mix and match your restaurants, uh, and you won't have problems with that. Copper corrosion, septane number, vacuum distillation. 
Um, all these other specifications, you really don't have to worry about, quite honestly. The number one are the ones we mentioned, um, the top five. Those are the most important to keep in mind. Um, feedstocks. Now, typically, being uh, either a small producer, um, you're going to be collecting oil for free from restaurants. And we kind of describe how to do that, how we've done it successfully, and um, what we provide our customers um, and make them happy are the, the lifeblood for the small producer. Um, if you go to a higher volume, um, you might want to look into trying to make a make a business relationship with a farmer or you know some other type of place that uses oil. Um, be creative. That's that's kind of the number one name of the game. With this is uh, once you start making a lot of bodies, you're going to want to make more. It becomes uh, sort of a seek for uh, your your feedstock, which is also known as your primary uh, ingredient for biodiesel. So that's going to require your own creativity. Um, and, you know, just have to knock on doors. Uh, and use your own create, you know, creative, creative, you know, maybe you'll find something, uh, maybe a potato chip factory near you. Who knows? Uh, go with it where you may. Um, another one is is finding your uh, source of chemicals. You know, those are fairly easy. I would recommend getting a business license, um, registering your business, um, following the rules, and getting your chemicals the right way. You know, tell them what you're doing. They may come out and say, well, you can only have this much. Uh, talk to your municipalities, but uh, that's up for you to to follow the paper trail. Call up your cities. How much methanol can I have in my garage? How much methanol can I have in my shop? Am I zoned for industrial? Am I zoned for residential? Am I zoned? You have to, go, you know, if you live in a residence and you're doing this, you have to have a homeowners association possibly. Um, if you are in an industrial or commercial place, how much sodium hydroxide? How much methanol can you keep in your in your area? So these are concerns that you should address and hit them head on first. Usually, you call these departments, the EPA, OSHA, and all these places, your water waste treatment facilities, and tell them what you're doing. Um, they'll usually point you in the right direction, and maybe you can talk with them before you have any problems. It's better, it's better to talk to them first and uh, find out if you're not going to get in trouble before you know you get a big hefty fine. We don't want anybody to get fined. Um, we you know we can only give advice. We can't uh, we can't give you exact legal uh, legal uh, advice in this, but we can only tell you what works for us. So, anyways, just just be smart about it. Use common sense. Although common sense is not that common, but. Uh, you know, hopefully you had the common sense enough to buy this package. Uh, you know, give us a call if you have any questions, and uh, we'll, we'll point you in the right direction, hopefully. Um, okay, so we mentioned what to use. You know, I'm looking over my notes here. Now, people ask you what kind of oil. You know, typically most of the oil you're going to run into is going to be soy. Um, I have transesterified in the beginnings almost any oil you can possibly think. Um, soy, canola, corn, um, you name it, cotton seed, um, peanuts. So we've got, we've pretty much transistorized all the oils, and we really haven't found any oils better than another. Um, you want to stay away from uh, the hydrogenated oils, and uh, really watch out. Uh, if, if your oil you're collecting from restaurants is solidifying at room temperature, <laughs> don't use it. It's easier just to get rid of those relationships than it is to kind of like uh, how should I say harvest them. It's really, it's really not worth uh, the hassle. You have to deal with losing chemicals and time and all that stuff. Just, just get rid of it. Ask them if they can change to a healthier version. And if you have a website or something, you know, highlight them. Say, hey, look, they just switched to a better type of oil. It's a little trick you can do, but it's mutually beneficial. Not only for that, their customers are getting better product for their hearts, but you're also getting a better end product when they get uh, rid of their used vegetable oil. So that's a little bit of advice for you. Um, now let's talk a little bit. We kind of went over what transesterification is and what reaction times. Um, you know, with 22%, uh, typically most oils, uh, that's 100% more uh, methanol than is actually necessary for a reaction to occur. But what we do is we, we put more uh, alcohol in there to ensure that the reaction occurs. Um, it would be sort of like... Uh, Trying, well, I don't know how to say it. It's a super, it's saturating the solution. It's almost a guarantee that you're pushing the reaction over. Otherwise, uh, you're thinking about molecules that, you know, you get that 98%. You know, if 98% is already done, you're trying to mix and match one alcohol molecule with a uh, tri or a monoglyceride, and they have to eventually hit each other. So by saturating the solution with lots of excess methanol in there, it almost guarantees that that random. Um, that random glyceride is going to react, so that's why we use a greater than 100% uh, ratio. I gotta answer the phone real quick.
All right. As I mentioned, water is um, another pro is is a, is a big problem, and uh, I should reinforce that. You uh, make sure that there's no water in your oil, and the best way to do that is to actually have a relationship with these restaurants and, and, and watch how they deal with the cleaning of their grease grease pits. You don't want to pull from grease pits in the back, pump it out. It's going to be high water content. I don't care what region you live in. Those grease traps are nightmares. Um, I, I don't even use um, We have relationships in which we actually physically have our vessels there, which the restaurants pour directly into after, um, right before they're um, ready to start the day. So they come in in the morning, pour it into these vessels, and tighten them up, put them aside, and so we have a pretty good high quality control with our restaurants. And we, and we keep on top of them too to make sure that the oil that they're cycling is in an expedient fashion. Otherwise you can get really high FFAs. And when you get high FFAs, uh, that means the oil is overused, there's too much animal fats in it, you're going to have problems. Um, the higher you up to about four to five uh, titration values, you're going to have a hard time converting. Um, you usually have to use an acid base process after that. Which, if you're doing that, you're going to spend a lot more money and time than, than is really necessary into successfully creating fuel for your vehicles that uh, is easier to do. So, keep your water, you know, keep water out. Um, soap, soap's also a problem. You're inevitably going to make soap, especially in the beginning phases. Um, post reaction, um, if you're creating soaps in reaction, you get some problems with water. Um, post reaction, separation, your uh, biodiesel, your methyl ester solutions in the wash tank is going to have high amounts of sodium hydroxide, relatively, and high amounts of methanol, relatively speaking. Um, when it's done, it won't have any of these things. But the transfer of biodiesel into the wash tank is very critical. If there's water inside your, your wash tank, you have a high probability of creating soaps just in the transfer process. We use an acid pre-wash. We'll show you the percentages in our manuals and in our SLPs. Um, that usually prevents the soap formations. Doesn't guarantee it will, though. Gentle, gentle uh, first washes and gentle transfers for you know the high concentration of uh, methanol and sodium hydroxide in your methyl esters. So we recommend that. But uh, as far as the technology, um, let's continue on with that. Um, in biodiesel, uh, there's basically two types of uh, biodiesel production. And this is a generalization, but it's typically true. Batch processing, continuous processing. Um, batch processing is what we do on small scale. Uh, continuous process is basically one input, and it's constantly going in, and at the end side, you've got product coming out. Um, Usually you won't see those types of continuous flow processing um, with uh, the volumes until about a million gallons per year, plants. Um, it's just not worth it to build something so complicated. Batch processing is, is real typical up until you get to that volume. Uh, and a batch process is just basically you process this, this, this it happens in stages. Um, so this is, a batch, this is considered a batch processing uh, type. And our batches are typically about 32, 33 liters, um, that's, or 32, 33 gallons, which is about 120 um, roughly 125 to 130 liters. So, uh, anyways, uh, you do the math on that. Um, we use this using this little tiny pump engine, this little Harbor Freight engine. Uh, this would be considered uh, what do you call it? An agitator of sorts. But uh, specifically, what is that called? It's not continuous stir. Let me recall what that shear mixing. Sorry about that. Um, this is considered a shear mixing process. Uh, those little Harbor Freight engines uh, basically have a little tiny motor and it spins and when the liquid goes through it, that acts as the mixing agent. Um, on small batches, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, also, you've heard, you may have heard of what's called an agitator, which is nothing more than if you had a big tank, a big propeller goes in the center and agitates it. It's just basically a big mixer, a big blender. That's another way of mixing. Um, there's some very complicated sets of tubings that are designed that have little tiny wheels inside of them that pushes liquids and forces them to react to each other. These are all typically for hard, larger scale facilities. There's also continuous flow in which you have a really, really big bat and the contents of the bat are there for you know a prescribed amount of time and on an average amount, what you're putting in is pushing reacted things that have been there for a prescribed amount of time in. So a continuous flow reactor, uh, you know, you're guaranteeing or you at least have a, a statistical probability of the reactants being in there for three hours or more, depending on what temperatures you're running. But uh, for ours, uh, we use basically a shear mixer, and that's what that little engine does, and, uh, you know, an insulated reactor. That's why we like the, the uh, apple seed, which is the, the water heater reactor. Uh, it's insulated, it's heat elemented, you know, and it's, and it's got some really sturdy valves to it. Um, we don't use a plastic reactor processor because we find those to be dangerous to putting a heating element in plastic. It's inevitably going to cause problems, um, especially if you're not paying attention. And it's just not worth uh, telling people uh, to put those in their shop garages or, or small businesses because they're prone to uh, safety uh, issues, whereas the, the apple seed is a little more reliable and safe, in our opinion. 
Um, so there is a lot more to the details, which we get into in the SOPs. But uh, should be noted now, there's two typical ways to wash and get uh, the, met the methanol and the sodium hydroxide out of your biodiesel. Um, on a small scale such as this, the only cost affordable way is to use a water wash. Um, I, I've seen many things online, forums such as that. Um, you may have ideas of your own. That's great. We only address what works for reaching ASTM. If you have some information that uh, we could look into, we'd love to experiment with it. But uh, for right now, after you know over a year of doing this, we found that water wash is the most effective and it's the cleanest. And surprisingly enough, if done correctly, uh, your water treatment plants won't get upset. Now, if you live away, you don't want to be dumping your wash water where it could seep into the, the groundwater or into lakes or stuff like that. So you're going to have to look for an alternative solution. But if you have a municipality that allows you to process this gray water back into the system, um, this is why we use the wash water. Otherwise, you have to go on an exchange system, which is basically uh, reverse osmosis and, and a couple of other weird treatment treatment stages that kind of bond to those sodium, sodium ions and hydroxide ions and get those out. Um, and, Post, post reaction, and you're going to have to boil off your methanol, which is basically uh, on a small scale such as this, which is nothing more than a still. But uh, those are also dangerous, and we don't recommend anybody use them, and they're cost ineffective, especially in small scale batches like this. So we use a water wash. Um, we also show you the percentage of acid we use in our, in our pre wash uh, before you do the water wash. That uh, reduces soap formations, and it's actually the only way to go. Commercial facilities use it all over the world, and since we started using it, we haven't had uh, major problems with emulsions. Um, emulsions are basically the, the building of soaps and those soapy, uh, uh, kind of like mayonnaise. You know, you, it's basically whipped uh, white egg yolks and, and vegetable oils. That's what's going to be formed with, uh, you know, with, with poorly, uh, poorly post-reaction uh, handling of biodiesel and pre-wash. If you agitate uh, using your bubbler first, first time wash, um, you'll understand what that means when you look into it. Um, you may form these emulsions, and emulsions are hard to break. They require time, heat, acid, energy. Really, they're, they're, you want to snub them in the butt before they even get there. So we recommend an acid pre-wash. We tell you the percentage chemicals to use in our uh, manuals. So anyways, uh, I suppose that's kind of like the overall big kind of quick view of what biodiesel is. It's, 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 it's really deceptively simple to make. But uh, with the knowledge that we've given you in these manuals and online and uh, with, with uh, the DVDs, you should have a pretty good grasp of, of, of how to make uh, biodiesel correctly. If you have any questions, email or uh, call us and uh, we'll address any uh, specific issues you have and, and, and in doing so we'll update these manuals for, for future people who are interested as well. So treat this as a dynamic, uh, don't be afraid to call, email us and uh, let's keep the dialogue going. We'd like to continue to make this the best uh, possible uh, package in the world for creating small scale batches of biodiesel for you the small producer. So with that, uh, have a great day. The next video is uh, we're going to go to our shop and uh, we'll, we'll teach you the three secrets of biodiesel production. Um, until then, I will see you soon, and have a good one, and thanks again for purchasing the ABC123. Have a great day. Bye. All right, welcome back. In this discussion, we're going to talk about what we describe as the three secrets of biodiesel production. Um, we can't stress that the first one is the most important, and it is. Uh, and that is the quality of oil that you're getting from your source. Now, you won't have very bad quality if you use virgin oils, but as we stated before, virgin oils are extremely expensive uh, per gallon, and uh, it's really not the angle that uh, we want to go, because our goal in uh, producing biodiesel is, uh, is a number of reasons, but uh, one of those is to keep our uh, fuel expenses down. And when your initial cost is uh, virgin oils being at $3, $4 a gallon, um, kind of eliminate that. As being, a, as being a benefit to biodiesel. So we have tested out no less than uh, two dozen restaurants, and unfortunately, a lot of the restaurants that we've tested, and they happen to be chain restaurants, um, overuse their oil. Um, in the filtering process of uh, chapters one through four disc, you'll notice that uh, I wouldn't even, after testing a lot of these oils, I wouldn't even eat those restaurants. They're so high saturated in fats, um, meaning the animal products, their oil is being so overused that uh, it's, it's pretty disgusting. Um, a good example of this is the oil that uh, I have in this vessel here. Um, I collected this from a fast food chain, um, very well known one, I'm not going to bat it out from here, but uh, what has happened is, is I let this sit outside for actually a couple months. And what has happened is, is a lot of the sediment animal fat is, is uh, kind of separated down, but this is going to be an example of how there can be good and bad oils 
inside. So this first pour off is going to be partially good, and we can use this stuff for the most part. Nice and clear. This is all pretty good. And then we start getting into what I would call an animal fat layer. And I'm going to bring the camera over here just to demonstrate and show you what good versus bad looks like. So on all, on all outsourced looking, I mean, looking at the oil looks fine, but as you look further into it, it turns tan. And this stuff at the bottom here, this will clog up your filters so fast that uh, they'll be ruined and you won't be able to recover from them. Um, this is actually not the worst sample. If you get oil that has been uh, obtained that uh, turns solid at room temperature, you're in big trouble. Um, now, we should have to say, the number one important factor in successful biodiesel production is getting good oil. And there's many ways to do that, but we found the most the easiest, the most effective way of obtaining good oil is really simple. Build relationships with your clients, with your restaurants, and that's not too hard to do. Typically these restaurants, depending on the region you're at, are having companies come and dispose of their oil for them. They're paying a service company to come and take their oil away. You're seeing trends uh, transition away from that, but that's still the, the, primary, uh, the primary way that people, restaurants get rid of their oil. Try to approach some mom and pop stores um, and do what we do. We, we approach mom and pop stores um, and instead of having them pour into a grease pit or a 55 gallon drum, which you can provide for them, we've provided, we've obtained these blue containers. And these containers can be similar or the exact same ones we, you know, we use. But uh, we use these containers, we drop them off, the restaurants will pour their used oil in them, seal it off, and in certain circumstances they put them on their back patio. Um, other circumstances, they put them in a locked uh, shed of sorts. But um, this way it's protected from water contamination, which is next to animal fat saturation and overuse of the oil, water is the biggest killer. Um, you can have perfectly good oil, and if it has water in it, you're going to cause the formation of lots of soaps and emulsions in your reaction process, and you're just kicking yourself in, in, in the wrong direction. You want good oil without water. So, build relationships. If you find that a restaurant or a vendor is giving you too high fat uh, concentrated oils, ask them if they could, uh, you know, suggest that their stuff's probably not meeting health standards, for one. And two, see if they'll uh, play ball with you. You can give them some free advertising, uh, whether you, you build a website or not, or if people ask, you can put, you know, their restaurant name um, on, on your vehicle or something. But uh, try to build a relationship with them and get good oil. Um, there's only true one way to find if you have oil in, or water in your oil. Let's get a hydrometer. There's some affordable ones on the market, but uh, we haven't had any problems since we established this uh, pour inside the restaurant into these containers and seal them off. Um, we typically uh, just deal with restaurants like that, restaurants like this that have really high animal fats in them, and we take that titration and it's above four or five. We don't even deal with them. We just say sorry, or we suggest that they can, if they want to come back you know, switch out the oil more often, um, you might be surprised. Uh, another thing, part of the secret of getting good oil is don't be afraid to ask for a contract. Um, if you're serious about biodiesel, you have a good relationship with a restaurant, have them sign something. Say, hey, I'll pick up your oil for free for the next two years. Just uh, be loyal to me and I'll be loyal to you. I'll, I'll, I'll speak good words to you and you know, you do the same for me. People aren't afraid when you, when you offer them something for free to take you up on it. So. I suggest uh, you do both of those things, and that's really the biggest secret: is is, is securing your, your good oil source. And, and that's it's not so much a secret, but you really have to be aware of it and, and be aware that that is the most important, you know, part of biodiesel production. So, first secret: get good oil, secure it, secure it with the contract if necessary. Um, now we'll move on to the second second most important secret, and uh, let me put this stuff away, and we'll move on to that. All right.
right, so now we're on the biodiesel secret number two. And uh, this one is, uh, is a very important one to adhere to in your processing of biodiesel. Um, I've seen a lot of people uh, mess their entire processing up, even large companies, by, by not adhering to this very simple secret. It's uh, don't skim. Um, there's three things that are, are very important not to, uh, not to abuse, and that is your chemicals. Don't skimp on your chemicals. You'd be very surprised how quickly you can, uh, you can go from really good biodiesel to really poor biodiesel by uh, trying to cut back on you know, minimal amounts of chemicals. So don't skimp on your chemicals. Don't skimp on your time. Your time. Biodiesel sometimes takes time. Um, what I mean by time is, is you, may, you may find that three washes is appropriate. I found more, more often than not, four washes is necessary. Even this Arizona climate, uh, typically that fourth wash is to uh, eradicate some of the residual acids that we use in order to neutralize soap in the beginning of the wash phase process. But uh, you know, if, if you're right on the edge there in your third wash and you decide, well, it's good enough, you go put it through the dryer, before you know it, you keep on doing that, and this entire process that we built, the SOP, the, the documentation, that little tiny skimp on, on one water wash, you know, it, 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 it costs you. It'll cost you in the long run, it's an additive effect, sort of like a cumulative poison. If you keep on having that attitude and, and you skimp here, skimp there on uh, your time, it's going to affect you in the long run. So the secret is not to skimp on chemicals or time. And the third one is too, is this heat. Um, Biodiesel loves heat. In all the processing of biodiesel, heat is, is your friend. And we find if you can find a way to harness heat and, and keep heat in the process, your, your wash separation times are going to go faster, your reaction times go faster, your separation of glycerol and biodiesel uh, proceeds faster, uh, your bio dryer proceeds faster. So if necessary, you know, we don't need it here in Arizona where right now it's 110 in this room. Um, but during the winter, we're going to insulate these tanks using bubble wrap or something cheap, just so we don't uh, waste, you know, waste the, you know, ambient uh, temperature that's, that's uh, basically back, not evaporating, but uh, you know, second law third right edge just kind of breathing off of the system. So we want to contain it, insulate it, and heat. So patience is, is all these things. So don't skip on your chemicals. That's very important. Don't do it. Just just flat out don't do it. And don't skimp on your time. It's uh, very important that you, you, you have patience. Now, there's, better, there's ways of making up for you know, the, the necessity to, to push more biodiesel out. Um, we're actually converting over to a 275 gallon system here to produce more. Um, and basically, just with the same kind of principles that uh, you have access to now with all the diagrams for you know, the bio dryer, the wash tank, the processor, the auxiliary tank. These things can be translated into a larger scale system. So if your problem is you're not producing enough biodiesel, contact us. We'll give you advice, especially when we're still developing and expanding our system. Um, we'll give you direct advice being our customer already on uh, how to expand your system. But don't expand your system and your output by skimping on chemicals, time, and uh, you know, patience, and, and try to harness that heat. Those are, those are very important. That's a, that's a very important production secret. So, Hold that to your heart and uh, keep, keep, you know, keep that in mind when, when, when producing biodiesel. And uh, now we'll move on to uh, secret number three, which is you know, also quite interesting. Um, it actually has to do with your own personal attitude and, uh, and, and your own resilience in this. Uh, biodiesel is in uh, toddler stage, the infant stage is being passed. Uh, it's up and walking now. There's a lot of people who know what to do. There's big companies out there producing a lot of, uh, a lot of gallonage. But uh, one thing that I know for certain is that uh, quality will always win out. And uh, if we can get you to believe and uh, believe and, and process like we do, um, I think there's some great opportunities for you. But that takes the secret uh, number three, and I hope that you can find it. So in a second, I'll uh, tell you about secret number three. All right. Time for secret number three. And when you review these, these aren't necessarily secrets, because you may hear them in other places. But the reason why we label them as secrets is because we found that so many people don't adhere to them, and uh, it's almost like a kind of a do or don't, you know, system. And if uh, you keep these to your heart, you keep these in your mind, you keep these in your processing, you're going to have a great deal of success in your biodiesel processing, more than most people will. Um, you know, this is a scientific process. I wish it was as easy as washing a you know bag of laundry, which I know that there's some systems out there that claim to be. Um, unfortunately, they're quite expensive, and uh, you know, unless you can afford one of those, 
I say the old-fashioned way is the best, and it kind of reminds me of uh, those old World War II posters with a picture of the lady flexing her arm, and we can do it, you know, and we can do it. And the third secret is never give up. Um, can't drive that home enough. Um, this isn't an easy time, not for a lot of people, but uh, when you get this process down, you'll become comfortable with it, and you'll be easily after you get the expert, you know, the expert uh, insight of these things, you'll be able to fuel vehicles, fuel fleet, um, based upon learning what we're teaching you right now and what you'll learn in the SOPs. It's very methodical, uh, very well thought out. Um, we use basic equipment. Um, the reason being is it's affordable. Uh, we want you to learn basic equipment because once you learn the basics of how the system works, uh, how, how biodiesel processing is made, you'll be able to use your own insight to expand upon the process. Maybe you'll come up with some inventions on your own, but uh, you'll never be there if you quit. Um, so you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make a lot of them. The reason why you bought this is to try to avoid a lot of the mistakes that we've made over the past year. So in doing this, never give up. And, and luckily for you, um, because you have purchased the ABC123, you have us to rely on. If you see something weird in the tank, you can go and spend four or five hours on an online forum, or you can give us a call. Um, there may be some things that we haven't seen, but uh, I doubt it, um, or I could run into. So if you have any questions, you know, try to look at the SOPs, read over the you know, documentation we've given you, but if you come to, a, come to a dead end corner, don't give up, give us a call, email us, um, find out what's you know, the quickest way uh, to get a hold of us, and, and we'll get back with you. So you know, these three secrets, uh, secure good oil sources, don't skimp on chemicals, uh, time or heat, um, and never give up. Um, you'll be able to be a successful biodiesel producer. It's very rewarding, um, especially when you finish your first tank. Um, perhaps you've bought biodiesel from other places and you know how it works, but uh, there is a little trepidation involved. But when you put your you know, first batch of biodiesel in your vehicle and you're actually running down the road, it's going to put a big smile on your face. And uh, we hope you get to that point. And we hope you get to the point where you're doing this for other people too. Um, we've included this documentation, you know, some getting legal advice. So, you know, encompass everything we've done. And if uh, there's something missing, uh, suggest it to us. Uh, say, you know, hey, what about this? What about that? Um, this is a new living document. Um, is, it, the more customers we get, the more information we're going to get, the more feedback we're going to get. So it's going to be refining itself over the next uh, period of months, years. So um, adhere to the secrets um, and use them wisely and, and make some good biodiesel. We know you can do it. Follow our system. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, give us a call. But uh, with all my heart, thanks again for purchasing the ABC123. We're here to help you. So uh, anything we can do to that effect, we'll do it for you. And uh, good luck, and uh, keep in touch. We'll talk to you soon. So right now, uh, I would say uh, start building your equipment, download it, uh, register your product. With uh, After getting started, you're going to have a little registration page. Go to our website, register the product if you're ready and comfortable to make that step. Once you do so, you're going to have a bunch of uh, documents that you can download and start constructing your equipment, either from local sources or purchasing the kits from uh, our local or our, our, our national vendors. They can send it right to you. So find out what's best for you and uh, follow that protocol. And uh, have a great day, great night, whichever it may be. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.